immediately. I would like to call on the first presenter who will be presenting on the osteology of the thorax. I would like to call on um, Golding, Miss Golding, to take up this um, presentation. Okay, hi everyone, good evening. Please, can you send a message if you can hear me? All right, thank you. So we're going to start with the astrology of the thorax, like he has said. So the thorax refers to the upper region of the chest wall, like the upper chest wall. And it comprises of the thoracic cage. These are talking about bones. We should be talking about the thoracic cage. So the thoracic cage consists of three major bones, which are your ribs, your sternum, and your vertebra. Now, what this thoracic cage does is that it protects the internal organs, like your heart, your lungs. Those ones are found in the thoracic region. So that's what it does. So let's go to the first component of the thoracic cage, which is the vertebra, the thoracic vertebra. So I'm coming, I think I have to display something on the screen. Mm. Okay, so. Kids, so sorry, I don't know if people can still hear me. You. Please send the message if you can hear because I think. Okay. Can you see what's on my screen? All right. So I've said the introduction. We're going to the thoracic vertebra. So this is the structure of the thoracic vertebra. There are 12 in number, T1 to T12. Now, these are some features. You see where they put the body, that, that heart shaped structure, that's the body of the thoracic vertebra. Then there's a circular part up above the body, that's the vertebra foramen or the neural canal. That's the space in which the um, spinal cord passes through. Then you can see the lamina there. In the anatomical position, which is the second image here, the lamina is is immediately inclined, as you can see from that point. Then you have the pedicle, you have your transverse processes, these two. And then you see the free set for, for tubercle of rib on the transverse process. The ribs, they have a tubercle, which articulates with this um, free set of the transverse process, forming the coastal transverse um, joint. Then you can see another articular free set on the body of the rib. That's for articulation with um, the costal cartilage of the rib. So I think that's all for features of the thoracic vertebra. Let me go back. All right. So this thoracic vertebra, like I said, they are 12 in number, T1 to T12. They are joined together, like they are joined by what we call the intervertebral disc. The intervertebral disc has two parts which is the nuclear purposes and the annulus fibrosis. The annulus fibrosis is a fibrocartilaginous um, something, let me put it like that. It's fibrocartilaginous in nature.
this. So I'm going to share my screen again. Yes. So this is Jurassic Cage. I'm talking about the ribs now. There are 12 ribs. The human body has 12 ribs. As you can see from this diagram here. Now there's what we call true and false ribs. Rib 1 to 7, they are called true ribs. While rib 8 to 12, they are false ribs. Then there's what we call vertebral, sternal and vertebral chondral rib. From this diagram now, you see that rib 1 to rib 7, they all articulate with the sternum, the costal cartilage. That yellow part is the costal cartilage. And this thing looking like a tie there, that is the sternum. So that green part is the sternum. So they all articulate with the sternum, forming the vertebral sternal. Um, so telling you that those are the vertebral sternal ribs. While from rib 8 to 10, this 10 is not really in the right place. Let me see like that. But it's supposed to join this ninth cartilage. Rib 8 to 10, they all join the costal cartilage of the seventh rib. So they are called vertebral chondral ribs. Why 11 and 12 are free. If you can see from the diagram, it's showing very well that they just stay posteriorly. They don't really come anteriorly to articulate with either the costal cartilage or the sternum. So they are called floating ribs, just 11 and 12. Then um, under classification of ribs, you have typical and atypical ribs. Rib 3 to 9 are typical ribs. Now, why are they called typical ribs? There are some features that are of a typical rib. A typical rib has four parts, four major parts, which is the head, the neck, the shaft, and then the angle. So the head is that part that articulates with the vertebral, um, this thing, the thoracic vertebra, posteriorly. So this diagram now at the back, there, that's where you have the head. I think I have a diagram of, okay, yes. So from this diagram here, you can see the head, where you see articular facets. That's the head. It has two articular facets, one for articulating with the vertebra above and one for articulating with the corresponding vertebra. So if this is a, um, this is a third rib, it should be articulating with T3, while the other articular facets that articulate with the vertebra above should be articulating with the um, T2 vertebra. Then you can see another structure there, which is a tubercle. Now, when I was talking about the vertebra, the thoracic vertebra, I mentioned a facet from the transverse process where the tubercle of the rib articulates with. So this is the tubercle I was talking about that forms the costal transverse joint. Then you see this point where this where the rib like turns downward. That's where they call the angle. That point where it like bends. That's where they call the angle. And you can see there's a groove there called the costal groove. This costal groove transmits three structures, a nerve, a vein, and an artery. So um, that's it. Then the neck. The neck joins the shaft of the rib and the head of the rib. So that point is where the two come together. The neck continues as a shaft. These are all features of a typical rib. So I'm done with the typical um, ribs. So, for the atypical ribs, there are five in number. Rib 1, Rib 2, Rib 10, Rib 11, and Rib 12. Now, what makes them atypical, meaning they are not typical? For the Rib 1, it's short, it's C-shaped, and it's sharply curved than the other ribs. So, that's a one feature that makes it an atypical ribs. Another thing, it has just one articular facet. The remaining ribs have two articular facets from this diagram that you can see on the screen. It has two articular faces for the vertebra above and for the corresponding vertebra. But for rewind, it has just one, one articular facet. And on that thing, it has two grooves, an anterior and a posterior groove. The anterior groove transmits the it transmits um subclavian vein, while the posterior groove transmits your subclavian artery. Okay, so those are features of the first rib. Now we'll go to the second atypical rib which is the rib two. So this rib differs from the other typical ribs in the sense that its um, anterior surface, it's actually, the superior surface is roughened, I mean, for attachment of serratus anterior muscle. And it does not have that sharp bend, like that angle, that sharp bend, that sharp twist that makes the, this thing, if you see it in the diagram, these ribs here, they have a twist that makes 
before they come anteriorly lies the angle. So that's another feature. So it has no twisted shaft. Let's put it like that. Then for the next one, that should be the tent rib. The tent rib has just one articular facet, particulating with the corresponding vertebra, which is T10, instead of two, like a typical rib. That's another feature. That's the only thing that differentiates the first rib from other typical ribs. You know, that's the rest features of a typical rib, just that it has just one articular facet. Then for rib 11, um, wait, if you can't see the screen, please reply if you are still following. You know. Let me not just be talking for waste. Jesus. Please reply if you are still following and you can see my screen. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. Let me continue. So I was talking about the atypical ribs. Let's go on. The next one is rib 11. Rib 11 is half the length of rib um, 10. It's half the length of rib 10. It has one facet for articulation with its corresponding vertebra, just one. And it's a floating rib. Now, floating ribs are those ribs that do not connect to cartilage anteriorly. They don't connect to the cartilage like anterior. They are just at the posterior region. They don't, they are just free there. So they are called floating rib. And rib 11 is one of them. Then the next atypical rib is your um, rib 12. What makes it atypical again is that it's very short. It's also a floating rib. The body contains, sorry, the head of the rib contains just one articular facet for articulating with T2. So those are the features. So that's why they call those ones atypical ribs. So I'm moving over to the sternum, which is the last component of the thoracic cage. So from this diagram, you can see that it's kind of like a tie. This knocked part, the upper part, is what they call the manubrum. Sternum is divided into three parts, the manubrum, the body, and the xiphoid process. So the manubrum are the superior, or let's say the apical part. You can see two, um, two not. Sorry, let me not go to that one now. Like at the ap apical part, the central part, you can see an arrow going there. That's um, fusa there. That's what they call the jugular notch. The jugular notch. Then at the side, it has two notches again for the clavicle the two clavicles the media end of the clavicles those are called the infraclavicular notches that's where the clavicle articulates with the manubrum to form sternoclavicular joints at both sides and then this manubrum has just one articular facet articulating with the t1 sorry with the first rib then you see this point where the manubrum joins the body of the sternum. That's where this knot of, like the knot of the tie joins this other structure, the, the middle structure. That point is called the sternal angle or the angle of Lewis. This sternal angle serves as a, an important surgical landmark. It indicates that, okay, yes, that's where this, even accounting rib indicates that that's where the second rib is, so you can count. And there are also many clinical importance of that sternal angle, but I'm not going to go there because I'm talking about osteology. So the next part is the body of the sternum. Now you can see several articular facets there for second, because the second to seventh rib, they articulate with the body of the sternum. That costal cartilage articulates with the body of the sternum. So that's a landmark, a surgical landmark for that body of the sternum. And then this last um, small irregular bone you see there is what they call the xiphoid process. So it's an irregular bone, thinner than the body of the sternum. So that one is just there. That point where it articulates with the body of the sternum is called the symphysternal joint. So let's talk about ossification of the sternum. This manubrum of the sternum has just one ossification center. The body of the sternum has four ossification centers, while the xiphoid process, which is that small irregular bone, has just one ossification center. Okay, then go to the vertebral landmark. This manubrum, which is the upper part, corresponds with the T3 to T5 vertebra. So when you're counting your vertebras down, it's at that point within the T3 and T5 vertebra. The body is within 
the T5 and T9 vertebra, while the cephoid process is at the T10 vertebra. So those are their vertebral landmark. Now, clinical relevance of the thoracic cage in total. There's what we call flail chest, F-L-A-I-L. Flail chest, it's a, will I say a disorder, but it's characterized by like, how would I put this English and follow now? Okay, flail chest refers to um, a condition where you have two or three ribs broken at two or three regions. Let's say for this structure that you are seeing on my screen, let's say you have rib two and three broken, rib um, seven and six broken at the other side of your rib. So you have two or three, um, two, three or more ribs broken at several sides of the thoracic cage. So what now happens? It causes a paradoxical movement of the thoracic cage. What I mean, when you inspire, when you breathe in, when you inspire, meaning when you breathe in, the flailed segments, which are the broken segments, they are like pulled in. While when you breathe out, so when you expire, the flail segments, they are like, they move out of the thoracic cage. That's what they call flail chest. And there's another clinical career called pectus excavatum. It's also known as funnel chest. This is when the thoracic cage is compressed anteroposteriorly, like from the front backwards. So this pushes the sternum, which is this tie-like structure looking here. This pushes the sternum backwards. That's what they call funnel chest or pectus excavatum. So um, I think that's all for the osteology. Any question? Yeah. Okay, I'll type the clinical. All right. Please do. I'm trying to leave this. Uh, how do I stop my screen from showing? I'm still sharing my screen. I don't know how to stop it. What you should do is to um, mute. Just mute. Okay, cancel your video. Cancel your video. The video icon, click on cancel it. No, your video icon. Close that place you, you muted. There's a video icon there. Cancel it. <laughs> cancel your video icon you know the video icon there by the side of that um, uh, microphone icon just cancel it there. Uh -huh. all right so thank you very much Godin. and we learned a lot on what you just said in summary what i learned from what you just said now is that uh, Osteology is a um, study of the bones, and the bones are sternum, ribs, and the thoracic vertebra, right? He said sternum is having three parts. Then he talked about very clinic, a very important area, the sternal angle, which we need to know, very important. What are the structures we can find at that sternal angle? It's very important, so we should take note of that. Mm -hmm. Then the ribs. You said the ribs will classify them, the major areas will classify them based on attachments. That is, I'm classifying some in a way that I will be able to remember attachment and structure. Based on the attachment, we have the vertebral sternum as um, ribs one to seven. Then we have the vertebral chondra as um, ribs eight to ten, and the vertebral ribs that's eleven and twelve. Why vertebral sternum? You should know that vertebra and sternum, vertebral chondra, vertebra and costal cartilage. Then vertebra, just the vertebra is floating. So then, based on structure, we have the typical and atypical. Typical is the vertebra and the parts 
right? The body, vertebral, foramen, um, you have the pedicles, laminal, and transverse process. Okay, there's something I want us to really understand here that usually confuse. Um, I would like to ask it. As, I would like to bring it up as a question, though. You talked about the head. You know, the head has two facets. That is for the typical. Now, one thing we need to try to understand is how it articulates with the thoracic vertebra. Is it the superior facet that articulates or the inferior facet that articulates with the corresponding vertebra? Because that thing confuses students. So I would like to ask, and it's just a conversation though, I will can just clear that point up. And Golden, please. Hello, Golden. Can you hear me? All right. No, okay, let me just explain that. We have two facets, superior and inferior. So, for example, if one has just one facet, articulating with the facet of the body of the thoracic vertebra, but with two, the superior um, facet of that head is going to articulate with the rib, with one above, and the inferior. So, inferior always articulate with the corresponding. All right, so that's one point I would like to. So thank you very much, Godin, for everything. The video, your um, presentation was informative, and uh, I really um, commend that. So I would like to call on the next presenter, um, Sylvester. He's also presenting on osteology too. I would like to call on him to present on osteology of the thorax also. All right. So, Sylvester, please unmute so you can speak to us. Thank you very much. So, Sylvester is not online. I think we'll move on. So, let's go into the next topic. So, I would like to call on the next presenter who is presenting on the muscles of the thorax. So the presenter for the models of the us, please unmute and then uh, speak to us, all right? So it's open to you now. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Sir Lawrence. I hope you guys can hear me. Can you hear me? Okay, so... We move on. So we'll be talking about the muscles of the thorax, okay? So when we are talking about the muscles of the thorax, we don't mean the chest or the trunk. So some people actually find this confusing and they use it interchangeably. So the, the chest is actually different from the, when we're talking about the, the, uh, the thoracic cavity or the thoracic area. So when we mean the chest, we're talking about the superior anterior uh, aspect of the trunk, okay? So it does have to come across with that, uh, the asia appendicular muscles, okay? Like the thoracic, um, like the uh, pectoralis major and minor intersecting uh, and innervating, uh, uh, or should I say, functioning to, 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 con uh, to elevate or depress uh, the limbs, okay? So when we're talking about the uh, thoracic muscles, we're talking about the muscles that are actually found in uh, the thoracic cavity okay so okay i think i have to share my screen so keep talking to you i'm able to fix this my problem here so we have talked about the diaphragm okay we also have some other muscles like i said like the breast we can see the breast uh, for the female in in the in the chest region okay so we can see the the muscles there the pectoralis major the pedalis minor, the serratus anterior, all these muscles are, so we we'll call them the asia pedicular muscles. That actually, they can be found there, but its major functions are, they function in limbs, okay? So that is for uh, some of these muscles. But when we're talking about the true muscles, the true muscles of, of the limb, we mean, okay, I think I'm getting it. Okay, that's not it. 
So when we're talking about the true muscles of the thoracic cage, we mean uh, the serratus posterior, okay? The intercostal muscles, okay? Uh, uh, we're talking about the uh, transversus, uh, uh, okay, I think I got it. We're talking about the transversus uh, uh, thoracis, okay, which also will have the transversus uh, uh, abdominalis, which is in the, abdomen, uh, in the abdomen, I mean. So this muscle is like a continuation, but the one we can find in the thoracic cage is the uh, thoracus, thoracus uh, tracalis, okay. So we also have a uh, uh, levator, cosorantum, all these are true muscles that we can find, okay. So I think uh, the, uh, the images are back now. So basically, this is the diaphragm, okay? So the thoracic cavity is in this form, okay? The person presenting in osteology already explained this. Well, I would like to add like the, uh, the, the thorax, or should I say the, the ribs are in a way such that its diameter increases inferiorly. So you can see the, the, the diaphragm with the right doom and the left doom. And of course, the right trucks the right cross and the left cross, okay? So the right doom appears to be slightly above the left. It appears to be slightly above the left when the body is relaxed, okay? Now, let's go into uh, the proper, the muscle proper. So I said the muscles we could see in the thoracic, the true muscles, or should we call them the true muscles or the thoracic cages, the serratus posterior superior, the serratus posterior inferior, and the, uh, the intercostal muscles, of course, which is three, the external intercostal muscles, internal intercostal muscles, and innermost intercostal muscles. We also have the subcostal muscles, which you could find at this angle, that angle just uh, uh, towards the, the zyplot process, that angle, that's where you find the subcostal muscles because that is what we call the subcostal, okay? So this is for intercostal. Okay, let me just look for the summary. I think I have summary for everything. <clears throat> so looking here, you can find uh, uh, the muscles. I call them the muscles of the thoracic cord. So the serratus posterior superior actually is, is superior at Attachment is from the nuclear in a, uh, ligament of the spinous process of C7 and T3 vertebrae. Okay, C7 to T3 vertebrae, okay? So, interior attachment is from the superior border of the second to the fourth ribs, and its innervation is from the second to the fifth intercostal nerves. We know the intercostal nerves, which is actually, uh, the originate from the uh, thoracic vertebrae, okay? So, its main function is prospiration. What we're talking about prospiration, we means that, uh, we mean uh, that that uh, movement which you are aware of. So when you like you try to breathe heavily or or taking air, okay. So you see your chest or your your thoracic cavity moving. That that is what actually called perspiration. So it assists, okay, in perspiration. So it elevates the ribs, okay. So for the serratus posterior, similarly, it's it's superior attachment, the spinous process of the T11 and L2 vertebrae, okay. Interior attachment is from the inferior borders of the eighth to the twelfth rib near the, the angles. Okay, then its innervation is from the T9 to the T12. For the superior, it is the second to the fifth. Then for uh, uh, the inferior, it is the anterior rami of the T9 to the T12. Okay, thoracic spinal nerves. So it's also same function as the superior, which is prospiration, but it depresses the ribs, of course. Okay, so. We have the levator costurantum, which superior attachment is the transverse process of the T7 to 11. So T7 and to T11 is where its superior attachment is. So the in, uh, interior attachment is the so subjunctment of a, 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 
of the risk between the tubular and um, tobacco and its angle. Okay, so between the, the tobacco and its angle, you that's where it actually. Uh, I I should we have a video, but let me just try and round up because I don't have more time with me. So we also have the intercostal muscles, which is made up of uh, the external intercostal muscle, the internal intercostal muscle, and the innermost intercostal muscle, or originating or, or its attachments coming from the inferior border of the ribs, okay? Its inferior border is from the ribs. So we have its interior attachments from the superior border of the ribs also. So its innervation is the intercostal muscles, okay? So its function is to elevate uh, the ribs during forced inspiration, okay? When you force air into, into your lungs, okay? It assists in this inspiration, okay? So the tra uh, tracheus uh, part depresses the rib and the endochondra part elevates the rib also during active forced respiration, okay? So we have the subcostal muscle. I already explained where we can find the subcostal that is along the subcostal space. You can find the subcostal muscle there. So its superior attachment is the inner or the internal surface of the lower ribs near their angles, okay? So that's where we'll see them. So its main function actually is probably to act in the same manner as the intercostal muscles. So whatever the intercostal muscles do, you can also see them do there. So for the transversus thoracis, I said this transversus thoracis have its uh, it's a continuation. So you have the transversus thoracis, you have the transversus uh, abdominalis, abdominalis, uh, abdominalis. Sorry, mind my pronunciation. Okay. So its superior attachment is the posterior surface of the lower sternum. Its interior attachment is the inner or the internal surface of the costal cartilage, two to six, okay? So it's weakly, uh, the weakly depresses the ribs and also perspiration. So most of them actually help uh, in inspiration and expiration, that's of course respiration, okay? So uh, I think I should have... Yeah, thank you very much, Pastor Lise, for your presentation. Your presentation has given us an overview of what the models of the thorax are. Right? So you did well to an extent. You did well. So the models of the thorax, um, you said something about the diaphragm. The diaphragm is models are the ones you called last. Thing. The serratus posterior superior, serratus posterior inferior. Then you have your transversus thoracis, then you have the intercostal muscles, subcostal muscles. Those are the major muscles of the thorax, all right? So in describing the muscles of, the, of any region of the body, you should take note of the origin, the insertion, the action, the innervation, if possible, the blood supply, and then the clinicals involved when there is a damage to the nerves that supply that muscle, all right? So those are the things you should take note of, all right? So for the intercostal muscle, I would like to just give some, like, throw some light on it, just on those areas that are confused most days. The extent is what confuses most of the entires. You know, the external, internal, and inner muscle. The extent is it to the sternum? Is it extent to the sternum? Is it stopping as opposed to chondral joint? Is this um, at the sternocostal joint? Is it stopping as you get? For example, now you have the you have the external intercostal muscle. That one, when it gets anteriorly to the costochondral joint, it becomes a membrane down to the lateral border of the sternum. All right. So that's, and you should also know the direction it comes. From the direction it comes, you can know the action. Because note, muscles always act towards their origin. That's to say they pull any structure they are attaching to towards their origin. For example, you have some intercostal muscle. It originates from the rib above and sat on the rib, um, the hemisphere border of the rib above and sat on the spare border of the rib below, right? So what it's going to do, it's going to pull the rib towards its origin. So it's going to pull the rib below upwards. So if you know the direction in which that external intercostal muscle is running, you can know the direction in which it is pulling the rib. And you know that it is running in an anterior inferior direction. So when it's pulling the rib, it's going to pull it upwards towards the origin. 
So it's going to cause what? What we call the bucket handle movement. You get it's going to expand the transverse diameter of the thoracic wall, and that will cause inspiration. All right. Then you have your internal um, intercostal muscle. Know the 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 pattern it runs. It usually runs like hand and teeth. For example, you place your hand, you, you place your elbow joint at your the tip, your tip joint. That's the direction it runs in a superior medial direction. All right, it runs in a superior medial direction. So when it's um, contracting, it's going to cause what? It's going to reduce the thoracic volume. That's one thing I want you guys to take note of. Know the extent, like the internal intercostal muscle is extending from that costochondral joint. It gets to the angle. It stops at the angle. Just know those extents, all right? It's very, very important. So thank you very much, um, Master Odisse. You did a great job. You did a great job. So I would like to call on the next presenter. I'd like to call on the next presenter. Oh, I can see um, Golden, you presented on osteology of the thorax. Okay. So tell us, what is the shape of the um, vertebral canal of a thoracic vertebra? That's my first question. What's the shape of the vertebral canal of the thoracic vertebra? And then is the thoracic part of the vertebral column mobile? And why? What is the explanation to your answer? Is the thoracic part of the vertebral column mobile? Then the ribs, how do they ossify? Because that's part of osteology. How do the ribs ossify? Which mode of ossification? And then Golden, again, try and explain to us how does the sternum develop embryonically? Because as you're doing the thorax, you need to understand how the sternum develops because it's going to help you understand um, some anomalies of the structures in the in the thoracic cavity. Yeah, what is uh, pes excavatum? Okay, I hope you're noting down these questions. And any medical student that is um, online, this this application, we will ask you. Okay. Can anybody hear me? Okay. And then another thing on osteology, what are the clinical applications of the sternum? Okay. Where is uh, bone marrow biopsy carried out on the sternum? Let's hope Golden will give us an answer to that. Dr. Midek, um, good evening, ma'am. Good evening um, to you. Asked, you asked a question, I think this last one you asked, I think I will try to answer it. Um, another one, you said, um, what is the clinical application of the sternum? Um, I think the, the sternum, at times, is used to, when, like, to draw blood when they, when, when there's a need to test for like blood diseases most times. The sternum is we can take blood from the sternum to check for this blood disease. I think. To draw blood for what purpose? Like when when there is a test of um, blood diseases or stuff. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm referring to as bone marrow biopsy. Yeah, like in um, people you suspect they are having these blood cancers, like leukemia, and you want to check the bone marrow. 
So you do bone marrow biopsy and you can do it from the sternum. Yeah. You can obtain bone marrow from the sternum. I hope you understand what I mean, yeah? And then uh, on which part, which part of the rib is most susceptible to fractures and why? Which part of the rib um, is more susceptible to fractures and why? And then what are some causes of thoracic um, inlet syndrome and what clinical features do these patients present with? Thoracic inlet syndrome. And what clinical features do these um, patients present with? Then the other common question that you need to... Um, uh, somebody says they can't hear me. How many people can hear me? The favorite says you can hear. Probably somebody can write down these questions and you will type them later for the people who cannot hear me. Um, yeah. The, where is the position of the intercostal... Uh, I mean, where is the position of the costal groove on the rib and what's the clinical relevance for that? The position for the costal groove and what's the clinical relevance for that? Then based on this um, knowledge of osteology and the associated structures, explain the triangle of safety. What are the boundaries of the triangle of safety. The person that did muscles, what are the boundaries of the triangle of safety? What do we use it for? What are the clinical, I mean, the anatomical considerations that have to be put in place when you are um, carrying out a procedure at the triangle of safety? Which procedure is actually carried out at this triangle of safety? So anybody who has answers, you can respond, okay? Faithful, I can see you online. Give us some answers. Uh, Golden has told us the vertebral canal is circular. The thoracic part of vertebral column is partly mobile to allow for motion. Are you sure there is movement at the thoracic vertebral column? I don't think so because you need it to be very rigid because you have vital structures in the thoracic cavity. You need to protect the heart and the lungs. So if you're to compare cervical region, lumbar region and thoracic region, there is less mobility in the thoracic region for protection of vital structures. Okay, Stana has six ossification centers, four for the body. The body is formed by fusion of paired hyaline cartilage. They are called what? The sternal basal standbri. They are called standbri. So you'll form uh, the standbri will form two bars, right and left bars. And then with the folding of the embryo, the lateral folding of the embryo, the right and the left stand by fuse. That's how the sternum forms. You need to be able to explain the embryonic development of the sternum in detail. You can be asked that um, as a 10 mark question. Yeah, there's mid uh, sternotomy. Okay. When, for example, you want to perform a heart surgery, they will section at the center of the sternum. Then there's the bone marrow biopsies at the manubrium. Okay. The angle of the rib more susceptible to fracture because it's more fragile because that's where it's bent. Yeah, basically that change, that turning, that bend. So it makes it like sort of um, exposed and makes it more prone to fracture. 
flail chest. Flail chest is generally paradoxical movement, yeah, of the chest that is usually caused by multiple uh, rib fractures. So during inspiration, you expect the ribs to move outwards and upwards, but instead in flail chest, they move downwards and inwards on inspiration. Pes excavatum. The thoracic cage is compressed anterior posteriorly and the sternum is pushed backwards. What's the opposite of pes excavatum? What's the opposite of pes excavatum? A costal groove. Oh, okay. These are questions. Nobody has responded to them. Pectoralis major, mid axillary line posteriorly, level of the nipple inferiorly. Where exactly? Which intercostal space is a triangle of safety of a line? You need to find out which in, within which intercostal space. And what is the uh, clinical application for this triangle of safety? Like, what is it used for? Yeah, so I think I've given you enough things to, you know, jog on your, your um, memory. So if you have your answers, you can still type. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lawrence. You guys can continue with the discussion. Uh, thank you very much, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So we can get those answers and then we talk about them. You can type them out, you send them across, or you just type them here. So I would like to call on the next presenter, and Ms. Frenda, who is presenting on the breathing mechanism. So Ms. Frenda, are you online? Please don't move so you can speak to us. The group is open to you now. Thank you. Hello, good evening, everyone. Okay, can anyone hear me? Can I hear you, ma'am? Can, can anyone? Hear you? Okay, thanks. Um, I'll be presenting on the plural. Yeah, I'll be presenting on the plural. So before my presentation, like, sorry, after my presentation, I hope we'll be able to get um, the meaning of plural, what it means, the part it is being formed, the pleural cavity, um, the layers of pleural, the differences between the layers of pleural, that is the viscera and the parenteral pleural, um, the subdivisions of um, parenteral pleural, the clinical correlates, and the um, pleural course, and also the space of the, the roots of lung. Okay, can we hear me? The pleural is a double layer serous membrane. And then this serous membrane is being lied by mesothelium. That is a simple squamous epithelium. Okay. So, and this serous membrane, they surround the lung as a closed sac. So, and this closed sac is what is called um, the pleural sac. 
So the previous hack is okay. Let me let me see if I can share my I can share my screen to show us what I'm talking about. Um, sorry. Um, can we see my screen? Hello. Oh. Yeah. Can we? You were seeing my screen before. Yes, I can see your screen. Okay. Yeah, and I was talking about the plural sack, and I want to use a balloon for an example to give an illustration. This plural sack is being imaginated like when you fold your end and try to push them through the media side. So compressing it, it forms two layers. That is a serous membrane, two serous layers, sorry, two serous membrane. So you compressing it, it now forms two layers. One year at the front, I don't know, I, I will not be able to touch. This place close to the end and the one um, that is far. So, and there is a space there. This this space there around this is what is called the pleural cavity. So, because um, this pleural sac is being invaginated, that is pushed in. Okay, let me use this as an example. Let me use, sorry. Let me use, okay. Let me use this as an example. This is our chair here. This place, let me, I can zoom away. This blue, you can see this blue thing just like in, looking like a, a bottle or should I say a glass? I don't know, and I don't have a pointer. Okay, we can see where it's been labeled the long bird. Can we see where it's been labeled the long bird? There, that is where it will invaginate into this blue light. This light is blue, that is the sky blue. The long bird will push it like as it's, as it's developing. You can see the way it's changed here. As it's developing, it now compresses the pleural sac to form two layers. Hope we can get me to form two layers. So as this long board that is here, this thing here, is now like developing, like um, should I say, yeah, developing. So it now like reduces the size, the size of the pleural sac. So it now forms two layers. The Visceral, you can see where they label the visceral pleura, yeah, and the parental pleura. That is the outer part, is the parental pleura, while the inner is the visceral pleura. Hope you are getting me. So, so this pleura sac is invaginated by the developing lung, like I said before. So, it's from the media side, which, which reduces the pleura cavity into a potential space. So because this this lung because this lung not developed, so it now reduces the pleural sac and now forms a potential space. That is a thin space. That is why it's called potential space because it's now forming a narrow space. You can see just this one here. This one on red. You can see it here. So it's now making it from um a potential space that is thin space. Okay, now making it have the visceral pleura and the outer part, which is that is this red red part, now having the parental pleura. Okay. So we'll be talking about the layers, the layers of the pleura. I'll be mentioning the visceral pleura and the parental pleura. Hope you can hear me. Hope you can hear me. Yes, Is anyone here? Okay. Yeah, the layers of the pleura. We have two layers, the visceral layer and the parental layer. Let me still show us here. I've showed us before the visceral and the parental layer already. Okay, let me use this one. You can see this um this long here. Pink course. This part inside is the viscera. Why the one outside, the outer one lining. The thoracic cavity. Why this um, visceral pleura? It lines the lung. Okay, so that is the two, the two pleura, the two layers of pleura. 
So we're talking about the pleural cavity. This is the pleural cavity. Let me use this one deliberately fully. Um, it's not showing here. Um, but this pleural cavity is just the space between the viscera pleura and the parental pleura. So we'll be able to like get the what I'm talking about. Like this this part here. I told you the lung now compresses like invaginating to it, then now reduces the pleural sac to now form a potential space. So this potential space that I was talking about, this white place, yes, this place that I zoomed, is now the pleural cavity. Hope you're getting me. So this and this pleural cavity does not line inside the lung. Okay. No, it does not lie inside the lung. It lines outside the lung, okay? And there is another thing here that we did not show us. Um, this um, visceral pleura and the parental pleura, they are, they're like, they, they, are, they are continuous to each other. Like this part, let me zoom here. This part, we can see something like a tree there. When you go um, like to the media part, media to... Media to this chart here. When you go medially, like that space there, that has been. Let me show us from, from here. Okay, this is where the label is. I want to talk about the ileum. This ileum is just an area, the area where um, there's some structures that passes through the lungs, or maybe they are coming out from the lung to enter the mediastinum. And what is this mediastinum? This mediastinum is it's just located with the said. So the mediastinum is the cavity which is um, located between the two lungs, the left and the right lung, okay? And I'll be talking about another thing, the differences between the viscera pleura and the parental pleura. The differences, when they talk about viscera, viscera, you know, inner side, that is the inner layer, pleura, um, viscera pleura, inner layer. While the parental pleura is the outer layer, so another difference between the viscera and the parental pleura is that the viscera pleura is like it lines the lung while the parental pleura it's sorry it covers the lung that is the viscera pleura while the parental pleura it lines the thoracic wall okay and another difference between the viscera and the parental pleura is that the viscera pleura is being innervated by autonomic nerves or um, the thoracic vertebra of um, T2 to T5, why the parental pleura is being inhibited by the somatic nervous system. Oh, oh, we are getting me. And another difference again, the parental pleura is sensitive to pain because since it's lining the thoracic cavity, so when it's being punctured, you might feel a pain. Why the viscera pleura is insensitive to pain, okay? Because it's just like located inside, inside the body. Like it's not, should I say, it's visceral, just like inside. So another one, the difference again, I'll talk about the development. The parental pleura, it develops from the somatopleuric layer. We know the, the mesodem, like the types of mesodem, or the division of mesodem, which is divided into the somatopleuric and the splashnopleuric. So this parental pleura, is developed from the somatopleuric. So when you hear the word soma, soma that is a cell wall or something you can see. So why the viscera pleura it develops from the splashnopleuric layer of the mesoderm. Okay, splashno that is a viscera viscera layer. Hope you are getting me. Hello everyone. Hope you can hear me. Uh, you can continue. Oh, yeah, okay, let me... oh, I don't have time. Okay, and another thing I said we will know is the subdivision of the parental pleura. We have the we have just four subdivisions of the parental pleura, and these um, divisions, like the subdivisions, the their names are corresponding to the structures like the region at which they are be located. That is where they got their name to. Okay, we have the coastal pleura is a subdivision of the parental. Pleura. We have the selector pleura, we have the mediastinal pleura, we have the diaphragmatic pleura. I hope you're getting me. 
And then, um, like I said, I said the guys, the name from the region at which they are located. When you hear coastal plural, coastal, you just know that it is located at the coastal region of, of the Jurassic cavity. Why when you hear the word Seveka, Seveka plural from um, its name, it's, it wouldn't be like, it's, it should be at the neck region. Let's say at the neck region, Seveka plural. Why the mediastinum pleura is located at the media in the region of the mediastinum? Why the diaphragmatic pleura located at the region of the diaphragm? Okay, so I want to show you an image. So we'll just like know the the subdivisions that I'll be mentioning and get the names that I'll be calling. Let me see. Should I use? Mm, I didn't even see everything. Okay, let me use this one. Can we see my screen? Hello, can we see my screen? Yes, ma'am, we can see your screen. Why don't? Okay. Yeah, I said um, the subdivision of the parental plural, they got the names from the regions they located. You can see our pointing in the labels. Okay. So that is, um, yeah, the cervical pleura is still um, located. Okay, let me just see. It is located at above, should I say above the next region or middle, middle one third of, of the clavicle. Okay, let me say above the clavicle. It should be above the clavicle. Why we have the coastal pleura, which is lying the coastal regions, lines the rib, lines the sternum, lines the intercostal spaces in the rest. So we have the mediastina pleura. Line them. You can see the mediastina, then the diaphragmatic pleura. Okay, I move on to, to the clinical correlates. So there are, there are some sites where the parental pleura extend to. I'm sorry, they extend beyond them, some, some parts in the thoracic cavity. And this is um, in danger of being injured because since they are like um, not covered, not covered totally um, with the Jurassic cage, they might they, like they might be in danger of being like injured. Hope you are getting me. So because um, this paints up lura, because when it's being punctured, it can lead to um, nematuras. Nematuras is um, um, should I say abnormal accumulation of hair in the Lira cavity, if I'm not mistaken. So, which leads to collapse of the of the lung. This um, pneumothorax is part of these um, pathogens. Is it not um, the efficient? Because you have other ones like um, the. Hope you can hear me clearly. We have other ones um, like the pyothorax, which is the pores. That is abnormal accumulation of them. Um, pores. We have um, um, another one um, from the name Emo. You know Emo is blood. Emo to us, abnormal accumulation of blood in the pleural cavity. And also effusion, like what I'm saying. Effusion is just the definition is or the meaning. It's just the um, abnormal accumulation of um, is abnormal accumulation of fluid yeah, in the um, pleural cavity. We already know, I already told us, um, okay, I already showed us um, the pleural cavity. That is the space between the visceral pleura and the parental pleura. And I told us the visceral pleura is it lies inside the lung. Is it inside the lung? No, inside the pleural sac. Why the, the parental pleura lies outside the pleural sac? Okay. So this same um, this pleural cavity is as fluid. It has fluid like like fluid that filled it, and this fluid is um, a serous fluid. It's not more than um, five million to ten million. Okay, so this fluid is supposed to be five to ten million. So when it's now like more than ten and uh, five to ten million, it's not causes efficient. Of which I explained to us that it is um, the abnormal accumulation of fluid in the pleural cavity. Okay, hope you are getting me clearly. Hope you are getting me clearly. So I can. I let me mention. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. okay, okay. I I will I will run the document. So they I, I was talking about some of the parts at which is not covered in the 
um, sorry, in the there is some of the parts of the pleural cavity that is not covered by the thoracic cage. We have them because okay, let me show us. Let me show us this image. Let me show us one image. Okay, let me use this one. The sites where the parental pleura extend beyond the thoracic cage and is in danger of being injured because it's not covered fully by the thoracic cage. Okay, we have the one above above this middle one third of the clavicle. So on both sides, middle one third of the clavicle on both sides, and we have the one beyond the this the we know the um, the zephyroid process that is of the sternum. So this zephyroid process and this same, um, should I say, um, should I say, how will I even say it? But this thoracic cavities or the thoracic, this thoracic right. cavity, like they say, right. how would they? I so the one, it's, I don't know it's, eh, sir? Yeah, please try and run up. Our time is long spent. Okay, let me just run up. Um, let me talk about the nerve supply. The nerve supply. Um, the coastal pleura is supplied by the intercoastal nerve. The media stena, that is, I'm talking about um, the nerve supply of all the pleura, both the subdivision of the parental pleura and the sub of, and the, and the pleura and cell, that is the um, types of pleura and so The coastal pleura is being supplied by the intercoastal nerve. The mediastinal pleura is supplied by the phrenic nerve, and the diaphragmatic pleura is supplied by also the phrenic nerve, both um, that is over the domes by the phrenic nerve, and also around the periphery by the lower cis intercostal nerve. While the visceral pleura is also is supplied by the autonomic nerve from the nerve visceral autonomic nerve, while the parental pleura is supplied by the somatic nerve, okay? Um, another thing now I will talk about is the that's a, um, let me talk about the recesses. We have um, two major recesses and we also have minors, but we we'll only mention the the majors. The majors we have the coastal diaphragmatic recess and the coastal mediastina recess. And when you hear coastal diagram um, diaphragmatic recess, that is um, just a space, a potential space between the coastal, the coastal and the, the diaphragm or the diaphragmatic pleura. Okay, so this um, coastal diaphragmatic vessels is um, the lower area of the pleural cavity into which the lung expands on inspiration. Then, so it's now it's now referred to as the coastal diaphragmatic vessels, and the second one, the coastal mediastinal vessels. That is the the sorry the potential um, space between the coastal and the mediastinum. And my guys, I should just round up by just should I say okay? Let me just end here. If you have any question, you can just drop in the group. Thank you. Oh. All right, we'll be coming to the end of this section. So please, if you have any question, please drop in the comment section below. Um, please, if you're right, uh, I want to commend you. Your work was in terms of synopsis, it was okay, very perfect. It was okay, the way you arranged the, the presentation, but you looked a bit that's why we didn't do much. That's why if you see my doctor, um, for me, they didn't really press on questions just for you to get an overview of this, um, uh, of the concept of. The topics in Torah. So you've gotten an overview now. So going to your textbooks to study now, you should already have a picture of everything. Your histology, your muscles, your breathing mechanism, media stadium, your trait We didn't talk about this. And then the plural. Now you have an overview. So if you go to your textbook now, it becomes something you've done before. All right. So we're going to see how this section again, but not anytime soon. So we're going to have a section again. By that time, you've already grabbed, you've already grabbed content already. You already know much about these topics, all right? Well, so what we're going to do is this: those questions that we're giving to you, try and take note of those questions. I invite them in notes. I'm also going to, I'm recording this video or this audio. 
So I'm going to send it. I think I'll convert it into either an audio note or a video, which should be sent across, which should be uploaded. You can go through it. It's just an interaction where you try to like catch up and see for yourself things that you need to know about view for going to your studies. All right. So if you have any question, please ask your questions. Drop in the comment section below. Below as we round up with this section. Because time is fast spent. All right, in the absence of absence of question, we'll come to the end of this section. All right, come to the end of this section. So our next section, it will be passed across to us information on our next section we pass across to us. Is it going to happen coming Saturday or the upper Saturday? So just get yourselves ready, all right? So I wish you guys the best in your studies. Give it your best shot, all right? Study smart, active learning. Use question.